Hi everyone, welcome back to Music Appreciation. Today we're taking a look at Chapter 61, a knee play from the opera Einstein on the Beach by the composer Philip Glass. Uh, Philip Glass is one of the most influential composers of the 20th century, um, so I'm really excited to be talking about him today, and we are still in the mid-20th century by this point. Um, and he introduces for us an entirely new style of music that we haven't discussed so far yet. Um, so I've mentioned several times uh, that the 20th, 20th century is really what I like to call uh, the century of isms. We talk a lot, um, meaning words that end with I, S, M, these isms. So different artistic movements um, that manifest not only in music, of course, for our purposes, but also in all other forms of art as well. So painting and sculpture and architecture and literature, etc., etc. Um, so a little bit of background here on minimalism in general as a style. Um, as the name implies, it is something, uh, art that is built out of minimal materials, in our case, minimal musical materials, um, and it's really just the repetition of very sparse, minimal, uh, brief ideas. And it's this continuous repetition, which of course can get boring, um, but over time as we continue with the repetitions of uh, whatever main idea or fragment that we're working with, um, subtle transformations happen over a longer period of time, um, and sort of over time we see transitions or transformations happening within that piece. Um, so it's often, uh, minimalist music is often also referred to as process music, which is why I underline that word right here. Um, and this has to do with sort of the action of listening that occurs um, when we hear minimalist music. Uh, because we are looking for these very short, brief ideas that are varied and transformed very slowly over time, uh, very subtly over time, we are uh, in effect listening to internal processes occurring and how each of these different events sort of relates with one another. Uh, much of this music and also this um, style of painting is also considered to be non-representational, uh, meaning uh, it's not actually depicting any particular uh, object or person or thing or place. Um, and so you can see that in this example here. This is a painting by the minimalist painter Frank Stella. Um, it is non-representational. It's not a picture of a horse or a person um, or a landscape. Um, it's simply kind of abstract squares. And so we can also think of the square here as being um, our sort of main melody, if we were going to use an analogy to music. Um, so the square is simple, it's basic, um, it's very, very minimal, uh, but what he's done here is just simply repeat that square over and over and over again. Each time it's slightly uh, bigger, each time it's filled in with a different, a slightly different color, they all kind of fade into one another, um, and overall just repetitions of a very simple idea results in a pretty beautiful painting. Uh, here are a couple other examples of Frank Stella paintings. You can see he has a very clearly defined style. Um, very, uh, he likes to work with rectangles and triangles and squares, um, horizontal lines. Um, here are some paintings by the minimalist painter Mark Rothko um, to contrast that as well. He has a very different style, but similar idea here. Um, if you were to look up Frank, uh, Mark Rothko's paintings, um, there are just hundreds and hundred, hundreds of them, and they all basically look something like this. Uh, variations on two rectangles or squares, um, kind of color blocked in solid colors stacked on top of one another. Um, and my favorite painter here, uh, another example of minimalism, um, these are by Agnes Martin. And um, she works with, she likes to work with uh, patterns and grids painted in very light pastel colors, almost imperceptible sometimes. So here, of course, we're working with horizontal lines and three colors repeated over and over again. And then, of course, here, repetition of dots um, on a slightly, dis uh, a background with a slightly different color. Um, so, all similar ideas basing uh, upon minimalism. Here's an example of minimalist sculpture, Richard Serra. Of course, here our main idea, our main melody, is going to be these long sheets of metal that are curved and warped, and he simply just placed them in different positions, um, so variations on the same idea. 
Um, and you're probably also familiar with uh, minimalist interior design that is very much in, uh, in fashion these days. Um, and of course that means clean, simple lines, um, very basic colors, nothing on the walls, not too much decoration. Uh, so that's really probably something else you've seen in real life as well. So what does this sound like in music? We'll turn here to uh, our discussion about Philip Glass. He was born in 1937 and he is still alive and still performing and composing today. Um, and he is one of the first pioneers of uh, minimalism here in the U.S. Um, he's also notable because he's achieved, like managed to achieve uh, quite a bit of mainstream success. So in that way he's kind of crossed over from the classical music world into almost the pop music world as well. So even if his name doesn't sound familiar to you, uh, you very well may have already heard some of his music in television shows. Uh, I've listed a couple down here just for reference, but it's only a small sampling. Uh, the Watchmen movie based on the comic book, uh, the TV show Battlestar Galactica, uh, The Hours, The Fantastic Four, uh, video games, Grand Theft Auto, The Truman Show. Um, so he's been used all over the place. I think he does a great job of writing beautiful, a kind of brilliant music that's also very accessible um, and emotional as well. So it appeals to wide audiences. Um, so the piece here in chapter 61 is titled Knee Play and it comes from his opera Einstein on the Beach from the year 1976. Um, so you might already be thinking that these titles are very strange. What is a knee play? What does it mean for Einstein to be on the beach? Um, and that really is kind of the point here. This is an opera that doesn't actually have a plot. It's kind of an abstract opera, uh, which is very much uh, kind of the antithesis of what we think of an opera. An opera is, as you recall, basically a play with characters and dialogue and a narrative that's being sung entirely throughout. Um, so to remove the plot or the, uh, the narrative from an opera is really a pretty radical idea. Um, so it's, there's a lot of symbolism happening here, kind of a lot of nonsensical uh, structures and sounds and staging. Um, and it is, so it, it really is a bit, a, a bit strange to watch, especially the first time. Um, but it's open to interpretation. That's the, the kind of the point here, um, is that you as the audience members, each one of you can have a different reaction and interpret it in your own special way. Um, of course, we're going to be looking for minim minimalist elements that unfold very slowly with very subtle changes throughout. Um, so we're, at the beginning, introduced to our main ideas, and then very quickly they start to transform, but it also kind of remains static. The transformations are so subtle that it's um, each time you hear when it almost becomes kind of a big deal within the piece. Um, and as you can see here, I, here's a picture from a live staging of the opera um, and all of the characters wear these sort of like basic gray and white uniforms everyone wears the exact same thing the makeup and hair is very understated um, they often have very kind of blank faces and robotic like movements um, and this all kind of allows your mind to act as sort of the painter as sort of like a blank palette to work upon um, so as you listen, one particular thing that probably you'll notice right away is uh, the words. Um, so this is an opera without a plot, but it does still have a libretto, of course. And the libretto, as you'll recall, that's the text of the opera. That's what the words that the, um, the singers are actually singing. So if we don't have a plot, what are they singing about? Um, and you'll see in this excerpt called Knee Play, you will see actually three different kind of types of singing and each one of them is very nonsensical. So there will be um, two soloists and then a choir accompanied by an organ. And the organ plays the same three chords over and over and over again, never changing. But on top of that we have uh, the chorus who is singing both solfege and also counting. So solfege is uh, those are the syllables that are used to denote uh, notes on a scale. So do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. If you think back to Mary Poppins, that song, um, solfege. That's that's what that is. So some uh, chorus members will be singing do, re, mi, and others may be singing fa, sol, la, for example. 
Um, layered underneath that, we have continuous nonstop counting. So literally the, the chorus members are singing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and they repeat that over and over and over again. Um, so solfege and numbers, uh, those are both very basic elements, right? The solfege is the very basic elements of a musical scale. Everyone learns do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do when they're a little kid in music class. Um, and everyone, of course, knows how to count to eight. So these are very basic minimal materials that we're just going to repeat over and over and over again. And the way that they're transformed is through kind of uh, reordering the syllables in the solfege being sung and also changing up... Um, the numbers that are being counted. So they range from 1 to 8, but oftentimes uh, they don't go all the way up to 8. So they may count through 8, and then they'll go back and count through 3, and then back and count through 6. Sometimes they skip a number in between and leave a beat there. Um, so we're very subtly um, varying our counting as well. And over top of that, one of our soloists is going to be reading short sections of kind of nonsensical poetry as well. So I've included a, an excerpt of this poem here by Christopher, Christopher Knowles. And would it get some wind for the sailboat? And it could get for it is. It could get the railroad for these workers. And it could be where it is. It could Frankie, it could be Frankie, it could be very fresh and clean, it could be a balloon, and so on and so forth. So, of course, this doesn't really mean anything. It's also kind of a non-representational poem in a way. Um, so all of this combines together to create a very uh, minimalist, these are all very minimalist uh, kind of ingredients that come together to create this really beautiful piece. Um, so next I'd ask you to please go to um, the MyLab site, listen through it, and be thinking particularly about timbre form and these word music relationships. So can you hear each of those different layers or parts with the solfege, the counting, um, and the poetry? Do you hear how these are being repeated, how the patterns are being repeated and also varied? Um, and also just be thinking what makes this piece minimalist? Um, and of course you can listen to this on my lab and I've also included here in our class um, playlist uh, a, a live performance of it here right at the top knee play one um, I can't play it here in this video for copyright reasons I keep getting myself in trouble with that um, but I encourage you to listen through this as well or instead of the my lab version because I think it really needs to be actually seen uh, rather than simply heard um, so if you do watch this video, it's um, you need to skip ahead to about the 25-minute mark because uh, the first half is just the audience sitting down. It's kind of what's happening backstage. Um, but about 25 minutes in, it's about a five-minute piece. Um, and actually, you can see the soloists and the organist and uh, the choir and how they're interacting. And it really is a pretty uh, unusual opera, something that is still considered to be pretty experimental. Um, even though it's from the year 1976. Um, so I hope you enjoy me play, and thank you for listening.